Hello families, welcome to the Homeschool Bunch podcast. Today we are meeting with Amber O'Neill Johnston from the Heritage Mom blog. Be sure to like, click, and subscribe. Hey everyone, welcome to the Homeschool Bunch podcast. I have here today uh, Mrs. Amber O'Neill Johnston of Heritage Mom blog. Um, we're really excited to have her here today. We really love the wealth of knowledge that she gives to us on Facebook and all of her platforms. So um, first, I just want to give it over to Amber. Thank you, Amber, for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Good. Thank you. So, Amber, um, I did want to just ask you, um, I want to help our listeners, um, you know, who are, you know, new to homeschool or, you know, even um, they've been doing it for a while. I really want you to share with us, you know, how you got started um, homeschooling and what inspired you to pursue this educational path. No, definitely. So my husband, Scott, and I live outside of Atlanta, Georgia is our home base and our kids. We have four kids. The girls are 14 and 12 and the boys are 10 and 8. And we've been homeschooling them from the the very beginning. And we got started. It was my husband's idea. Um, I came into it kicking and screaming. And, you know, he had to make a deal with me. He said, if you try it for one year and you hate it, I'll never ask you to homeschool the kids again. And I was like, deal, I'll take it. Um, And I think that my daughter was in you know, she would have been in pre-K that year. So that built my confidence because I was like, ah, if I mess up, this is not even a real school year. (laughs) I don't even care. I'm just going to keep him quiet. And by the end of the year, I had completely and fallen in love with every aspect of it. Our time together, the whole ideas and concepts behind it, our lifestyle. And we never considered anything else ever since then. I love that. Mm-hmm. And as, so you've been a homeschooling parent for almost over a decade now. Yeah. So what's been some of the most rewarding aspects for your journey? Definitely for me, it's the time that we get to spend together and just the and intimacy for education, right? I definitely yeah. know all of my children's strengths and weaknesses down to a T, uh, but also just our social family culture and, you know, the inside jokes and um, the things, our routines and what it has allowed us to do schedule wise and having mm-hmm. plenty of free time and margin and built into our lives and the relationships that we've developed and the community that we have. And it just kind of, I, I definitely am sold out for it. So I, <laughs> I, I there, the, Oh, another rewarding aspect that I never expected is my education. So it's been like a second education for me. Yes. And, um, that has just been a complete delight. Like I'm reading stuff with my kids and I'm like, Oh wow. I, I never knew that that or this is so yeah. interesting and it You're learning me. it for the first time yes I'm, I'm learning it for the first time and yeah. um it's just so it's all so interesting and um really engaging and I I love it I love that so um also I want to you I want you to explain the type of learning style that you have for your family um, mm-hmm. we know that there's homeschooling we know that there's schooling at home um we know there's unschooling and world schooling Which uh, concept works for you and your family? And could you explain um, a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. So it's for us a mixture. I mean, we are home educators and when we're in the country, we're at home nestled in our in our house doing our thing with our local community. But we are Mm -hmm. also world schoolers and we're committed to spending long stretches of time um, outside of the country where we educate our kids. We've always gone during a school, you know, during the school year um, on Mm -hmm. our trips. And we usually, we aim for staying three months. Sometimes we don't quite make it. Sometimes we've been able to stay a little bit longer, but um, you know, a couple, three months somewhere different in the world and learning in their environment, meeting the people that live there and um, just engaging as much as we can in that local community and environment. And then my kids are doing their schoolwork while they're there, too. Yeah. And so where's your next journey to? Well, we're going to Asia next. Uh, I can't say exactly what country right now. We're okay. looking at Thailand. We're looking at India. Um, 
you know, one of my kids wants to do Japan. One of my kids wants to do China. Uh, we're, oh we're still debating um, right Rock, now. Paper, Thailand. Scissors. Yeah, basically. For us, you know, it really, we choose a continent before we choose a country. So I, that's how I know we're going to Asia. Um, okay. And then we look for deals, to be honest. We're not wedded to any one location. We are frugal travelers. We travel on a tight budget. And mm-hmm. so we look for those plane ticket deals and then look to see where we can afford to stay for several months without, you know, running out of money. <laughs> I love that. And so um, you say you travel for about three months at a time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what, what do you think are some practical tips um, or strategies that you can share with parents who are thinking about delving into uh, world schooling? Well, you know, there are all different types of world schoolers. Some people are digital nomads and they actually don't have a home base anywhere. They're Mm -hmm. 24 seven on the road or staying outside of their traditional home country. They work online and, um, you know, do it full time. And so that's one type of a deal where you're going to look at, you know, selling your home or moving out and downsizing your furniture either completely or getting a small storage unit and figuring out how you and or your um, spouse can make money digitally or in another country or another part of the mm-hmm. world. So for us, we keep our home base and we save money. We only spend cash on our trips. We don't charge anything. That was a commitment we've made. So it takes us a while between trips to save back up again. And mm-hmm. we live, you know, less frugally, but still frugally at home. And that extra money that maybe people might spend on, I don't know, you know, I, I don't get my hair done. I don't get my nails done. You know, we don't mm-hmm. get valet parking. We don't get a lot of Starbucks. We don't eat yeah. out a lot. Those types of things, all of that extra money is going into accounts for us that we use for traveling. Another thing is using a credit card that gives you really good points for traveling and buying tickets. Um, mm-hmm. We put every single thing in the entire world on a points card and that we pay off each month. And okay. we are able, like one of our trips, two trips ago we got all six plane tickets at no cost because we had enough points from that credit card so uh doing things like that we are self-funded you know we're not rich by any stretch of the imagination (laughs) and i I, it also depends on how you want to travel you know i always tell people uh you know i have friends where it's like the ritz carlton or bust you know we've never stayed in a hotel Mm. we are staying in like working class communities middle class working class communities we walk to the market we cook at home so we live when we're abroad pretty much the same way we live when we're at home and Mm -hmm. some of the other money that comes in that we're able to use is you know if we're out of the country then we're not doing piano lessons and the kids nobody's playing baseball and nobody's Mm -hmm. taking ballet and so those extracurricular activities and field trips and just you end up realizing you spend a lot of money on things other than just you know your mortgage and utilities and so So when all of that is siphoned in another direction, it makes um, living abroad less expensive. And of course, we pick places that we can afford to live as well. Yeah. And so when you pick these places, um, how do you incorporate like your world schooling in your educational curriculum Mm -hmm. to really just um, showcase the cultural richness of the different places that you're visiting while you guys are traveling? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, at the end of the day, if we're just going to sit at home at the table doing, you know, traditional schoolwork, then there's no reason to be in another part of the world. So the most most of our schooling when we're away is what we're doing there in that local community. So we get up in the morning, mm-hmm. we eat breakfast, we pack a lunch and we head out for the day. And we typically might maybe if we have time in the morning, do a little bit of math or read a book. And then mm-hmm. that evening when we come back, we might do a little something, something there. But for the most part, we try to incorporate it. So writing instead of writing in journals or writing essays, the kids are writing letters and postcards to friends and family back home. They're writing Tra- they're writing in a travel journal. Um, we read books. They Everybody has their own Kindle uh, that we travel with so that we're able to bring a lot of books. We listen to audiobooks. We do read alouds. Um, we bring mm-hmm. crafts and things with us on the road. But a lot of what we're studying, aside from, you know, math, I say would be the only traditional thing that we 
really bring from home always. We are mm-hmm. learning so much. A lot of times that there's a language barrier. So we're learning as much as we can about the language, the culture, we're visiting their cultural treasures. We're trying to get to know people. Like for us, the end all be all is like, if we can get an invite to dinner at someone's house, you know? So it's like, we're trying to build relationships. That is like the best yeah. thing ever. It's so like, good. I want to meet the locals. Yeah. Like, I don't want to just hang out. Like the way my mom travels, um is where it's very touristy um and it's like we have to go here at this time here at this time but I really want to meet the local and be able to hang out with them and go to you know somebody's getting married I'll bring a gift like I that's the you know I had that experience in one country only one time in my life and that was the best time of my life yeah, so. I, I'm right there with you. That's ex- yeah. to me. That's what the traveling is really all about. Mm-hmm. And um, we've had some great experiences. Um, we spent uh, several months in South America, and you know, to me, the sign of success was that when we got back, you know, a year or two later, one of the families we met there came and stayed with us in Atlanta. Yeah, and so like whole that, family. yes. And so we were like, this is, you know, this is what it's all, uh, you know, really about. And okay, um, community. Other cool things, you know, on our last trip, we were in Ghana and West Africa, and it just so happened we were with some local people one day, and they were like, oh, well, you have to come with us. And we're like, where are we going? They're like, just come with us. And we got uh-huh. to see um, some chiefs and, like, lesser chiefs and, like, main chiefs of a vill- in a village be installed, and, like, it got to attend their ceremony and see all of that. And it wow. was, I mean, it's the type of thing you can't, learn online you can read about it but being there and seeing their traditions and what they did and we stayed and ate with them and it was just you know amazing and I'm thankful to be able to share that with my kids but to be honest even I'm wide-eyed everywhere Mm -hmm. we go it's all new for me too yeah because you never really have these experiences and Mm -hmm. so I know that you said that you came into homeschooling kicking and screaming Um, But now looking from where you started to where you are now, what can you say about your homeschool journey thus far? Like, how do you feel as a mom, as parents um, from Um, what you guys accomplish? Wow. Well, I'm I'm very thankful and grateful. And I definitely feel like it it fits who I am as a mother and it fits my children. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm thankful that my husband was able to have that vision and see that because I could not see it. I was like, this brother is crazy. <laughs> and I don't know what he's yeah, trying to do to me. You do it? Yeah. I was like, no, I was like, you got me, you got me. Like, Rest yeah. up. This is the wrong thing. And yeah. I was, I really just couldn't catch the vision. I, I, I really wanted our kids to excel. And to me at that time, excelling, it was in the traditional sense, like get really yeah. good grades, go to the best schools possible, um, finish school as quickly as possible, be a superstar, get all the awards and accolades. Mm-hmm. And even when we started first started homeschooling, that was still kind of the idea. I was like, well, that's cool because she's so smart, as everyone thinks on their first kid. She's so yeah. brilliant. You know, we'll just fast track her through this. But in the the course of that first year, I was reading so much, so many books, so many articles because I was trying to learn. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that really stuck out, stuck out to me, no matter who I read, even people who disagreed about their educational philosophy for older children, they all Mm -hmm. agreed for younger children to give them time in their childhood, to slow down, to spend time outside, to let them Mm -hmm. play. And I was like, okay, if all these people, even those who disagree about things later, all say the same thing, I didn't have a vision for that, but I was like, let me try this, you know, and we ended up really slowing down and we changed all of our goals and acceleration became something we never talk about. And it turned into just moving at a um, really beautiful pace for all of the kids. And it's been nothing but upside for us. And I love that. And I know when you go to other countries, um, Something that always interests me, do you always um, look at their educational systems? Yeah, most of the places that we've been actually homeschooling is illegal. 
And so I get to have a lot of conversations with people about that because, Mm -hmm. again, we're there often during the school year. And here I am with my kids in this whatever town, wherever we are, people are going to notice us. Right. We've never been somewhere where we don't stand out a mom and four kids. (laughs) And um, we are walking around and we get to know people in the neighborhood and they all have the same question. Like, why aren't your kids in school? And so I get a chance to explain to them that I am their teacher and, and this is their school and people are Mm -hmm. always so um, just so surprised and interested and enamored by the idea so that's been fun for us um, in a lot of ways but we do visit we try to get to know I want my kids to get to know other students and children where we live and where we Mm -hmm. visit and so like the last time on our last trip my kids were able to go to school there three days and they got to spend the whole day in school and I was there too I wasn't always in the classroom with them but I was at the school as well they ate lunch there they played there they did all their classes they participated in a spelling bee that they completely were demolished in in. three days (laughs) yes they got to do so many things I know it was well the spelling bee was in English and the kids who had English as a second language just totally decimated my kids <laughs> oh my god i was like oh my gosh this is a different type of schooling you know very drill they drill a lot and oh yeah you know mommy judge had to step in a couple times because i was like oh no that is spelled the right way but you know they spell british english they were spelling the words according to british english even though we were in africa and i was like no i call foul mommy overbearing that was actually spelled the american english way so mm-hmm. it was really fun but it was great to be able um, for them to get a chance to see what it would be like to be in school in another place and for the teachers to um, invite them in and and how casual it was like we could just go to the school for a few days that would never be allowed here right in the states so that's true and so for some of your travels do you guys ever um, do you encourage your kids to do like digital journals or How do you keep up with some of their travels and their keepsakes? Mm -hmm. Well, we do a family photo book with, you know, captions and everything that we create and have printed. And we have a copy at our house and we give copies to each grandparent. And um, so that's a big thing. Like we know, like, okay, this is going to go in the photo photo journal. And we keep notes so that we can add these captions of all these cool things we're doing and places we're going. Um, But the kids also keep handwritten journals. And so that really has been the gift I can look back at you know mm-hmm. six-year-old so-and-so and see what they thought about what we did that day or where we went and you know a lot of people have said well, you spend all this effort and time and money on traveling with young kids and they're not even going to mm-hmm. remember it and I always tell people like there are a lot of things you do for your children when they're young that they may not remember the exact detail yeah. but they remember how it made them feel and you would be surprised to hear how often my kids do talk about trips that were when taken when they were very young and they they don't talk about the museum or where mm-hmm. we live but they talk about the people they remember the people they met and that we spent time and the with. food oh yeah and of like course. They, they may go visit again and they remember that smell you know yes. from having like a bowl, big bowl of paella or you know so Definitely. it's things like that but no i really um like that you guys are giving the experiences Mm -hmm. Um, to the children and I saw I see a lot of the world schoolers they say you know this year we decided we don't want anything for Christmas we want an experience and so I see a lot of um, you know families they do that now um, because it's really about the experiences and I really learned that um, during COVID Um, so I do want to know I know it may seem like we're so far away from it But um, I know you were homeschooling before COVID. How did that impact Mm -hmm. your homeschooling, um, like, during the time of COVID? Well, we were out of the country when COVID hit. We were actually in Greece. We were staying in Greece long term. And um, so it was... um, It was definitely a different experience than had we been here because we weren't at home and, you know, a lot of our time and focus went eventually to getting back home, which was difficult. Mm -hmm. But um, once we were able to make it back to the States, you know, to be honest, it didn't really change for us 
too terribly much. We mm -hmm. missed our community because we spend a lot of time out of the house with other people. So that was mm -hmm. definitely a loss emotionally for sure. But academically, we have a robust home library. So the library is being closed, didn't matter. And we already mm -hmm. had all of our plans for the year in terms of what we were going to learn and what we were going to do. So it didn't, you know, in fact, I remember trying to get my kids to understand how big of a deal this was because so we don't see our friends. But other than that, their day to day rhythms mm -hmm. didn't change. And mm -hmm. um, it was hard for them to understand how impacted the world was. Yeah, they were a little bit younger at that time. I think mm -hmm. they were like 10. Like one was 10, one was eight. Yeah, maybe a little, maybe a little yeah. older. I don't even remember. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a blur. <laughs> yeah. No, but no, I love that. So mm -hmm. I wanted to segue into um, just um, what role do you believe that uh, homeschooling plays in like fostering a deep, deeper connection with mm -hmm. one's heritage or cultural identity? Uh, I think it plays a huge role. So as an African-American family, you know, I look at all of the things that are happening in society and the arguments people are having about history and what to teach mm -hmm. and what not to teach and all of that. And I, I mourn for that you know, national conversation and the destruction that's happening and the fighting. But in terms of my own children, it's full speed ahead. It's like mm -hmm. blackity black over here. And like, I yeah. am, and I love it. You know, we're reading yeah. all the things we want to read and we're learning all the, the, the about all the people we want to learn about and the music yeah. and the poetry and the art and the, yeah. you know, we're doing all these experiments. We're learning about all these things. And I see what it does for my children. And it makes me sad that there would even be an argument or a, a question about whether every child deserves that. And not just black children, but every child every deserves child. to know um, who they are and where they come from and not just like once a year in February, but like every day, all year long. And that's what homeschooling has afforded us. So I think that to me, the yeah. biggest you know, notice of that was one time we were in the grocery store. This was a while back. And a lady said to my kids, she's like, oh, you guys are asking a question. How old are you? And they're like, oh, she said, well, what are you guys doing for Black History Month? And they all looked at her and then they kind of looked at me like, what do we say? Yeah. And I was like, oh, just a little this and that. And she was like, OK. And we got in the car. My kids were like, what does she mean? <laughs> and that was like yeah. the best like feeling to me. One on one hand, I was like, oh, my gosh, you guys don't know anything. But on the other yeah. hand, it was the fact they knew it was Black History Month, but they didn't realize that people do something differently. They, they, they thought we were just celebrating. But I was like, some people, this is like the only month that they pay attention to the to the mm -hmm. things of our culture. And our kids had been doing that all the time, that every month, every year. Yeah. So they were really surprised at that. And I thought, OK, glad I'm glad. I'm glad that that's shocking to you. And it shows me yeah. that we really are doing something unique in our home and that's something that really um, resonates with me too um I grew up in Los Angeles I grew up in like Inglewood specifically and just seeing um like the curriculum um from what I learned to versus like what my kid is learning now I didn't really know what he was learning until COVID happened yeah, and um, that was the next question I really wanted to ask is, yeah. um, how do you select these books and resources um, that really focus on such rich perspectives? Because um, mm -hmm. you're very you're very selective. I could tell mm -hmm. when you choose these books. So how yes. do you how do you do that? Like, what's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, first of all, I spend a lot of my time researching children and young people's literature. It's like a hobby. And okay. so to give you an example, like some people, let's say on a random evening or weekend night, they might be mm -hmm. watching TV or like their favorite shows. If you ask me about any show, I'll be like, I have no idea. I haven't watched TV in like 15 mm -hmm. years. So I read books. I read children's books. I research yeah. them. I read blogs. I read rev book reviews and I spend an obnoxious amount of money on books and the ones that aren't good. I don't don't share the ones that are good. I share the best of the best. And I am really good friends with the librarian. I'm there all the time. I have multiple library cards. So wait, um, the librarian is your bestie. Yeah. That's like, this is, oh we're, my God. we're in there, right? They yeah. know me very yeah. well. Um, I <laughs> so I have two library cards. Each of my kids mm -hmm. has one and my husband has one. So, you know, we have a lot of library cards between us and we check out tons of
of books and I read them mm-hmm. and review them. And I'm very passionate about it because um, I know that there are very few people doing this work. So mm-hmm. most of when I started homeschooling, I would look up these book lists online, like what are the best books to read to children? And, you mm-hmm. know, it was all the same as Charlotte's Web and The Secret Garden and Stuart Little. And, yeah. and I'm like, these are the great. And I read those. Gray. All, <laughs> all of those, all of those same books over and over. And I'm like, this is right. We read those books. They were good, you know. And I was like, so when is there going to be a book that is about something, someone who looks like my kid? about Mm -hmm. or how about about anybody else and it just they don't exist on most of the best of the best they're book lists out there like but they're not the best of the best and I decided Mm -hmm. that I would be that person who's comes along and says oh you don't want to miss this one guys this is this is one of the best of the best the books that make my children smile and fall in love with reading and I just kind of got addicted to it from there and, and it took off I love that. And so uh, do, how many books do your family read like on average a week? Is there an average? Oh, my gosh. I can't even say they're all over the place. And the funny thing is, you'll I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm actually a really slow reader. So I don't read super, super fast. It's just that I'm always reading. And so that's how I make it through. And my kids are like that as well. Some of them are fast readers. One of my daughters, I don't even know how she does it. It's like her superpower. She reads and she just tears through every type of book all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. And the other ones are readers, not as much as that sister, but they all read. It's okay. It's part of the culture of our family. Right. So we pick up books, we read them, we talk about books over the dinner table. When we're on a road trip, we listen to audio books. We take, you know, plan out our week like, okay, on Thursday afternoon, we're going to go to the library and get all our new stuff. And so I think that out of, you know, the love of the mother's heart, right, it flows on to her children. And, you know, moms who can sew really well. My girlfriend's like a master seamstress because her mom was one and she taught her that. Well, this is what I do. And I taught it to my children. And that's what oozes from our family home. Um, And then I wrote a book. And part of my book is about books. And so that led even further into the research and talking about it and being exposed in that way. Yeah, I love that because I I did see um, that you wrote a book Mm -hmm. about a book (laughs) um, about your love for books. And so what led you into your love for books? Mm. It was the feeling that my kids were getting left out of the beauty of what was being offered in terms of resources for homeschoolers and really Mm -hmm. just children, period. And I just, um, my daughter didn't like it and she would say things about it often. And it broke my heart to be honest, Mm -hmm. because I'm her teacher. So it's my job ultimately. Like I can say somebody, I wish somebody else was doing this, or I wish they were doing that, or I wish they would provide this or provide that. And I do have all those wishes, but at the end of the Mm day, the people that are responsible for my kids ultimately are me and my husband. Mm-hmm. And so that's what made me really roll up my sleeves and do this work thinking there's got to be a better way. And yeah. um, I encountered this idea of mirrors and windows. So mm-hmm. Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop, she, I saw some research. It was old research that she had done and she'd written this like essay, kind of like a paper. And mm-hmm. she called books mirrors and windows. And I was like, what's mm-hmm. this she's saying? And I read yeah. more about it and it really resonated with me. And I thought, okay, so a book can be a mirror, a place where a child sees themselves and their families and their communities positively reflected and yeah. they see, they feel seen and known and, and they're intrigued. And it's like they see themselves in this story. And then books can also be windows where mm-hmm. the children have a chance to get to know someone else in the way that they live and, and how they see the world and the experiences they have and how they feel about those experiences and their family mm-hmm. life and their culture. And then the idea that the same book would be a mirror and a window, depending on who's reading it. And that Mm -hmm. fascinated me. And when I started thinking about that and evaluating our home library and the books I was, you know, using for our, my kids' education, I realized, Mm -hmm. okay, my kids are swimming in beautiful windows, but there are no mirrors in here. And um, that was a problem. That was a problem. That that resonates with me too, because um, as you mentioned, you used to do these searches for what's the best list, you know? 
And so I say, you know, what's the best list for teenagers? What's the best list for teenager boys? And then what's the best list for teenager boys who were into game? Then you go into chat GPT on trying to find like the best list. <laughs> um, but that's been the toughest part of finding, you know, what my kid is into because I look at some of these books um, and just similar to what you see like online, you know, I want to definitely talk actually about technology, but um What's in these books doesn't really resonate with my son. Mm-hmm. And that's where you, you go with the, uh, you say, the windows and the mirrors. Yeah. So I would love to find ways to find. That's why I said the books that you pick out, they are so precise and intentional. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's evident. You know, I follow, I follow a lot of bibliophiles on, <laughs> on Instagram and you're one of them. And it's literally like you put, it's like, you know how people make their favorite meal it's yeah. like when you find your favorite book, you're just like, oh, chef's kiss. Like, like you're <laughs> raving about the book after you finish, you know, reading it. You're going to the author's page and, you know, everybody gets a comment. Everybody gets, a, you know, audio review. Um, yeah. That's how I see you. <laughs> so it's just like um, I've read, you know, some of the books that you've recommended. Um, and I think it's very um, helpful. And I think that's, you know, it definitely resonates with how you, why you created your book, too. Um, yes. Because it does help us, you know, celebrate our heritage and see our community. Um, and I would love to know, do you have any more books coming up? Uh, always. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I haven't announced, you know, what's coming, but there are okay. more books with a plural coming down okay. um, the pipeline. And I think people will be very excited. So there's a little something for people who love books and a little something for people who love other aspects of homeschooling. And um, I've been busy working. So that's why my blog has been a little quieter than usual. And mm-hmm. I haven't been as active on social media. I'm still there, but not as much as yeah. I used to be. And um, that's because I am. I'm busy down here writing and really excited to be able to share new things with everybody really soon yeah I love that and as a homeschool parent of four how Mm. do you find time for self Mm -hmm. well that is a challenge let me tell you so um I think a couple of things for me I wake up really early in the morning and Mm -hmm. um that I don't want to wake up really early I'm not naturally a morning person That is the only time because I have kids who get up early. I have a teenager. So, you know, she doesn't even start talking to me until 10 p.m. Right. So (laughs) it's like our whole relationship (laughs) exists after 10. Um, And so, you know, we we, there I'm I'm mommy. I'm being mommy late at night. Mm -hmm. And then when she finally I'm like, okay, I cannot talk to you anymore. And then I go in my room and now I'm white and, you know, he wants to talk and all other things. So it's like the early in the morning is Mm -hmm. when I have my quiet time and I have my tea and I kind of do my own thing. Um, Also, Mm -hmm. though, my youngest being eight. I do leave the house um, to like on a Saturday morning, early Saturday morning when I get up, you know, most of my kids know how to fix food for themselves. My husband also is really fine with fixing breakfast for the kids. And I leave. I go to a coffee shop before they Mm -hmm. even get up and I might be gone for four or five hours. And I do that times a lot. (laughs) And so I think that those things definitely help me Mm -hmm. to stay um you know, to stay balanced and to feel rested and refreshed in a lot of ways. Okay. All righty. I love that. So um, lastly, um, what advice would you give parents who are interested in incorporating elements of world schooling, but aren't ready to make that leap yet? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I like to share something with people. When they think about world schooling, they think about doing school away from home somewhere else in the world. Yes, that's the most literal definition of world schooling. But mm-hmm. um, there was a guy named Eli Gerzen. He's the one who coined that term world schooling. And he mm-hmm. actually said that world schooling doesn't require world travel. He said that instead, technically, world schooling is when you actively experience and learn from the world around you, including the home, family, mm-hmm. friends, strangers of all backgrounds libraries, parks, sports, forests, schools, towns, and of course the world in the World Wide Web. And so yeah. to me, even when we're sitting here in Atlanta, we are still thoroughly world schoolers learning from our environment and the people and the world around us. And so I think mm-hmm. that 
if people have a heart for world schooling, that instead of thinking like, oh, someday maybe we could do that, I would say start thinking of yourself as a world schooler today and treating mm -hmm. your local community as if it is a part of the world because it is and diving in at the same level of enthusiasm that you would if you were, you know, in another country. I love that. And like you said earlier, you got to take it first. We, you said first we pick the country. Yeah. And then first with the continent. Pick the continent. Yep. And then, yeah, I like you got to take it step by step, brick by brick. Yeah. So yeah. I love, I love that what you shared today. So mm -hmm. it, it really sounds like it's, you make it seem like it's possible. And mm -hmm. from you, we know that it is possible. Um, yeah. There may be things, some, some things we may have to cut back on. Like mm -hmm. all the coffees and, you know, the random Target shopping trips <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. But um, it does create valuable experiences. And that's something that we want people to know that you don't have to be confined to your home. Mm -hmm. um, and you do, you know, you can still keep your home base if you would like. Um, mm -hmm. But I enjoy um, seeing your travels and seeing like I see I follow one person. They, they travel on an RV. You know, mm -hmm. one person is getting a, a schoolie bus. So yeah. it's like, I love seeing like these different options just so people know that you don't have to sit in these four walls yeah. every day. Like you do have options. So absolutely. I, yeah. I truly thank you for sharing your experience with us today. Mm -hmm. um, and we look forward to um, having our community join, learn more about your community. And if you could just tell the people where to find you on Facebook and Instagram and any other platforms you may have. Sure. My website is heritagemom.com. You can find out about my book at a place to belong book.com. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook at heritage mom blog. Yes. And you may see her this year at some of the conferences um, yeah. um, this year, too. So yeah. um, thank you for definitely sharing with us today, Amber. And yeah. we look forward to seeing you more. Oh, thank you so much.